Okay, now we are going to move on and uh, find out how to determine the Fermi level. Uh, we should remember that we have a set of three expressions to find N and P. Uh, they are listed here. Eh, vamos a determinar el nivel de Fermi o energía de Fermi. Recordemos que tenemos tres juegos de relaciones, de ecuaciones, para encontrar la cantidad de eh, electrones y huecos. Y los mostramos aquí. Tenemos este que involucra a el nivel intrínseco. Eh, tenemos el segundo juego, el que vemos aquí que involucra, bueno, y el de aquí también, que involucra a eh, las constantes, bueno, los valores, perdón, eh, NC y NB, eh, ambas ecuaciones, eh, una involucra al eh, nivel de Fermi y la otra involucra a la distribución de Fermi eh, cuando tenemos... Eh, Bueno, a la, a, la, a la función de Fermi media, ¿no? Bien. Al conocer ya sea eh, el nivel de Fermi N o P, con que conozcamos a uno de ellos, podemos conocer a los otros dos. Utilizando estos tres juegos de ecuaciones. So, using these three set of equations... We have the one that uh, uses the intrinsic level and the two sets that uses capital N for the conduction band and capital N for the valence band. Uh, one uses uh, the exponential function with the difference between the Fermi levels and the conduction or valence band divided by KT, while the other one uses the Fermi distribution. Uh, and when we know at By knowing either EF, N, or P, we can find the other two of these three variables. Now, let's find the exact positioning of a e I. How do we do that? Well, uh, let's start by uh, assuming that we are dealing with an intrinsic material. That means that N equals P. And also that the Fermi level is at the uh, intrinsic level. So EF equals EI. Therefore, a uh, from this value of n and from this value of p because they are the same we can equate those two equations i mean this equation for n and this equation for p and we can rewrite them here and here and, and as you can see they have been Re, rewritten and they're here then we are going to make some algebraic manipulations like moving nc to the right and this is what happens and we're going to move E to the left. Instead of putting it in the denominator, we are going to leave it at the level of the other exponential by uh, adding the minus sign, which means uh, taking the order of this subtraction and making it backwards. So uh, that will mean that 
EF and EC are kept in the same order, but EB will be negative and EF will be positive. EB and EF. And as I said before, NV stays at the, at the same place, but NC is now dividing. Then we're going to apply logarithm to both sides. So, of course, we have ln of this quantity. Let's make it in a different color. We have ln of this quantity, right? ln of e is just the exponent, okay? But we have two efs. We have the minus ec, the minus ev, okay? Uh, the kt, which is dividing, passes multiplying. Remember the ln and the e cancel out. And the exponent, the ef minus ec, etc., is now at the same level as the equal sign. And thus, again, the kt which was dividing is now multiplying. And that ef equals ei. So we can substitute, instead of 2f, we can write ei. That's why I have ei here, and the 2 is dividing here, which is this quantity it's here it moved to the right so it has positive signs and is divided by two and this whole thing is now being divided by two the two is here okay perfect now there is one final step a for this quantity nv over nc, we're going to use these equations that we saw before that make use of the effective mass and that's it, the effective mass for a positive and negative charges or carriers actually. And when we divide mv and v, sorry, over nc, we see that the two cancel out, uh, the KTs, the two pi H bars, and we will be left with MP over NC, over MN, MP over N, MN. Remember, it's NV divided by NC. That's why MP goes above and ME star below. The three halves, the exponent remains. So that goes here. The three halves, because it's the exponent in a logarithm, can be taken out. But there was also a two. So the three halves multiplies the two, and we end up with a three fourths. Okay? And that is the expression for the exact positioning of EI. Now, in Spanish, <laughs> ¿cómo encontramos la posición exacta de EI? Bueno, eh, partimos de que es un material intrínseco donde N es igual a P y, por, y también eh, el nivel de Fermi es igual al nivel intrínseco. Eh, utilizamos las fórmulas que tenemos de N y de P, que como son iguales, pues las igualamos, ¿ya vieron? Eh, Vamos a despejar NB entre NC. Aquí está NC. Es decir, esta pasó para acá. Eh, esto de aquí lo pasamos para el lado izquierdo. Usando el truco de que para no poner en el denominador lo pasamos la E a la algo con ese algo con el signo negativo. Que equivale a que EB menos F ahora sea EF menos EB. Y eso se ve aquí. EF, vean, positivo, menos EB. Y bueno, simpli simplificamos. 
Aplicamos logaritmo a ambos lados, simplificamos y nos queda de esta forma. Eh, recordemos que f y e y son iguales, por eso es que hacemos esta simplificación. El 2 lo pasamos dividiendo del lado derecho y esto también lo pasamos ya del lado derecho. nb entre nc. Utilizando estas fórmulas se simplifica a lo que vemos aquí. Lo metemos acá y el exponente 3 medios que iría aquí por reglas de los exponentes o propiedades de los exponentes sale como coeficiente. Pero como hay un 2, 3 medios por 3 medios es 3 cuartos. Esta fórmula es la fórmula del nivel energético intrínseco. Y nos damos cuenta que solamente estará el nivel intrínseco en el exactamente en medio, en el mid cap cuando la temperatura sea cero, ¿por qué? Pues porque este término se va a morir, porque multiplica por cero, o cuando MP star asterisco y M en asterisco, esta es de las más efectivas de electrones y huecos, sea cero, sea igual, perdón, porque entonces aquí tendríamos logaritmo de 1, o sea, es cero. Cuando eso pase es cuando tendremos el nivel, eh, el nivel energético intrínseco en el midcap. O sea, es exactamente en medio de la banda de conducción y de valencia. Exactamente en medio. So, with this formula, this one, we can show that EI can only be in midcap when T equals zero. That will kill this term. Or when defective masses are equal, because then this quantity will be 1, and the logarithm of 1 is 0. And so, that's, those two are the only situations when EI will be exactly in between EC and EV. Perfect. Now, let's see an example. We have silicon. We know that... The effective mass of holes is 0.81 and electrons is 1.81. We take this division, we find that it's 0.69, okay? And we put it in the equation we just found. Let's go back to it. We're going to make this calculation the one here, 3 fourths kT, logarithm of the effective masses, look above, the numerator goes holes, denominator goes electrons. So let's go back. 3 fourths kT ln 0.69. So we're going to do this at room temperature, except when they give us a different temperature. So 3 fourths, 300, the logarithm of, oh, well, sorry, K, um, this is uh, K, Boltzmann, I mean, this is T, so it's back, I mean, it's in a different order, and the logarithm of 0.69, and we get that MP over MN star, sorry, that the, pardon me, that 3 fourths of kT of ln of the ratio of defective masses is minus 7.2 MeV. So, the uh, intrinsic uh, level, energy level, is 7.2 below mid-cap, okay? This is a value that is so small that we can actually ignore this difference in most cases. Okay? Well, this is how it's calculated. Remember, it's below because the value is negative. Perfect. Now, let's move on and see what happens when we are working with a doped semiconductor. In this case, uh, we have values for capital N A and capital N 
D. We have acceptors or donors or both. We are going to assume that it's non-degenerated and it is fully isolated. Sorry, ionized, pardon me. So we use these formulas N and P. A We are going to um, solve for the exponent of the exponential function. So we're going to solve for EF minus EI in both equations. Okay? So it's actually shouldn't be that complicated. This goes dividing. We apply logarithm to both sides. Uh, this then uh, stays dividing and it passes multiplying. The same goes here. Okay? Uh, as you can see, this pardon me. Uh, yeah, this one here can be written in terms of P, okay, if I solve this equation and I just change the sign in front of it. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look at the full equation for n. So this is the whole equation for n, right? And that is big <laughs> by the way what can I do about it well uh, remember it's non-degenerate and fully ionized well we should remember that uh, this means that uh, in these cases For N, Na is negligible as is Ni, Ni, and Ni. So we have already seen that N will be about Nd, and we know from the formula of Mp equals Ni square that this is going to be true. In that case, we're going to use this formula here which is nothing but this formula formula A and in the case of P the same applies the same logic and D is negligible so we get that P equals NA and from this formula we know this thing here and we get formula B. And from the same reasoning, we'll get this equation. The conditions are again that ND is going to be much larger than NA and also much larger than NI. So these equations will work for finding the exact position of EI or EF, whatever, or both, maybe, uh, in a dope semiconductor that is non-degenerated and fully ionized, okay? Now, let's Actually, wait a second. Pardon me. 
no, it's fine. Let's look at the whole thing. Let's look at the Fermi level in silicon at 300 Kelvin. Uh, I want you to see the formulas that we just fa that we just wrote, how they behave. I mean, these equations were, if I remember correctly, wait a second. Yeah, these equations. I'm going, just going to rewrite them here. Look. Okay. Um, there, the formulas are here. Remember that KT is about 25.9 milli electron volts and that NI is 10 to the 10, 10 to the 10 cubic centimeters uh, over per cubic centimeters, right? And let's look at this graph. This graph was obtained by using these formulas, okay? In the vertical axis, we have uh, energy and we have indicated EI and the Fermi level. The Fermi level is either A or B. Using the formula for A, uh, pardon me, for A, where are you? It's this one. For A and for V. Right, so I want you to see that as we increase the either acceptor or donor concentration, the Fermi level separates more from the intrinsic level, okay? Why? Because simply and easily, the, this logarithm becomes a larger number as Na or Nd increases. Uh, this is happening at a fixed temperature of 300 Kelvin. Okay? Again, uh, we are talking about these restrictions here. Ni will change when temperature is different than 300 Kelvin. If it's higher, T is, let's say, 500 Kelvin, Ni will be larger. When is, uh, T is lower, Ni will be lower. This is the 3KT condition, which is what defines when is degenerate and or non-degenerate, or highly doped or not or non-highly doped, which is more or less the same uh, definition. By the way, this is called figure 2.21 from your textbook, in case you need it. Right. Now, We have, now we're going to talk about the carrier concentration and how it depends on temperature. Uh, let's look again at figure 220. I'm pretty sure we have it here. going to take a while it's a bit slow but it's there so I don't know why we need it but we need it for something <laughs> so let's go back okay so we have phosphorus in silicon okay and we know that the concentration is 10 to the 15 per cubic centimeter okay now Let's see, there is a region, we're going to call this region A, where the number of 
electrons is fixed okay why because that number is going to be more or less the same as the num as the number of donors we're going to call this region the ex extrinsic region okay and it's going to be more or less between 150 and Get away and that's horrible <laughs> and 450 more or less okay that's where n is about nd okay phosphorus in silicon right How much was it? 10 to the what? 10 to the 15. Let's see what we can see here. 10 to the 15 at 300 Kelvin. Well, at 300 Kelvin, and I is 10 to the 10. So that's too small, right? Ten to the ten. So that's a very small number. So we can say that yes, apparently in this region a NA is quite large compared to an I. And we can actually so what well, see what happens between 150 and 450. Let's go to the graph again. 150, which is not even in the graph, but we can assume that it's less than 10 to the fifth. And for 450, it would be 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. So it will be here nine eight seven six five and this will be which number is this ten to the thirteen two three four yeah like two times ten to the thirteen that will be n i remember that this axis is n i okay so the number is quite small as well 10 to the 13. So, an I f will be 10 to the 14. So this is between these two numbers, more or less. So yeah, extrinsic region. Below uh, 100 or 150, so more or less here, well, actually, more or less here, this will be section A, this will be section B. We have a freeze, which means that the number of electrons is much less than ND, which we have already seen uh, at 150, if you remember correctly, It's not even in the table, but it's less than 10 to the 5, right? So, and the number of electrons approaches zero as T drops, which is completely true, okay? So, that's why this graph shuts off, okay? And this is called a freeze. However, when we go uh, to very high temperatures, look, T is going up. Look what happens to N. Well, this is N over ND. That's why it represents a fraction. It's going super high. Let's see what happens above 450. Well, it is indeed about 450 the concentration 
the intrinsic concentration is going logarithmically super fast because here in 450 is 10 to the 14. In 500 is 2 times 10 to the 14. This is about um, 550 and it's 10 to the 15. This is 600 and it's 4 times the 15 and here is 1, 2, 3, 4 I think no, 2, 3, 4, 5, sorry, 5 times 10 to the 16. So it is increasing and this is at, oh no, I'm sorry, pardon me. This is at, I, I made a mistake here. <sighs> the concentration here is 10 to the 16 at about, uh, 650 Kelvin it's 610 20 30 40 yeah 640 650 more or less so it increases quite fast that's why we have this behavior you see this dashed line represents What's the behavior of an intrinsic material, one that is not doped, okay? And, well, you can see that this, um, well, that it goes quite fast. Okay, entonces, eh, aquí vemos la, cómo eh, cambia la concentración de portadores eh, con respecto a la temperatura. Si partimos de una muestra de eh, silicio dopado con fósforo, el fósforo es un, do, un donante, un donor, y la concentración de este fósforo, de este donante, es de 10 a la 15 por centímetro cúbico, tenemos tres regiones. Tenemos la región A, que está, es una región fija que se llama la región extrínseca. Ahí N es aproximadamente igual a ND. ¿Por qué? Porque tanto NI como... Bueno, NI es muy pequeña comparada con... Eh, comparada con NA, perdón, comparada con ND y lo mismo NA es muy pequeña. Entonces, por eso es que podemos escribir esto de acá. Por abajo de, de 150 para abajo, pues comenzamos a tener este comportamiento donde N tiende a cero conforme enfriamos por arriba de 450 la región C la concentración la, la N eh, aumenta mucho y supera a los electrones que son aportados por el dopaje de hecho eh, crece, tan, crece de la, del mismo modo que crece la concentración intrínseca eso se, se debe al fenómeno de la temperatura que la temperatura alta hace que la concentración intrínseca aumente y por lo tanto los portadores de carga que son aportados por la concentración intrínseca. Ok, eh, ¿qué más? Vamos a ver qué más hay, permítanme. ¿Qué más? Ahora, eh, cuando T tiende a cero, los electrones no pueden brincar de la banda de valencia. Uy, qué fue subido eso. <ríe> los electrones no pueden brincar de la banda de valencia a la banda de conducción, sino pueden brincar el mid cap. Y eso es un motivo por el que eh, N es muy baja. 
¿ok? Y tampoco pueden liberarse electrones de los sitios en donde, eh, por ejemplo, en este, en este caso, eh, tenemos un quinto electrón, ¿no? El electrón también está congelado en su, en su lugar, ¿ok? Entonces, así no, los, don, los donors, los donantes que tienen el quinto electrón, no se pueden liberar. Estamos hablando de esta región, será la región A, ¿sale? Bueno, realmente sería la región más baja, la región aquí. En la región B, que es cuando aumentamos de 0 a 150, algunos electrones de los donantes, el quinto electrón, puede ser que el silicio tiene 4, el donante tiene 5 electrones, es del grupo 5, estamos hablando de, en caso del silicio, ¿no? Puede ya brincar a la banda de conducción, ¿ok? De los que están aquí, esta es eh, donantes, pueden brincar para acá, pero muy pocos. Conforme aumentamos la temperatura, pueden brincar más, ¿ok? Y también, conforme aumentamos la temperatura, uno que otro de los que están aquí pueden brincar para acá, creando un par hueco electrón, ¿ok? Pero son muy poquitos. Aumentan más los de aquí, ¿eh? Esto genera que la concentración sea n igual a n de más, es decir, se ionizan algunos sitios donantes, ¿sale? En la región C, la región intrínseca, ya prácticamente todos los que estaban aquí en el nivel ED ya se ionizaron, ya se pasaron a la banda de conducción, perdón, se pasaron a la banda de conducción. Y también algunos de aquí ya crearon su par hueco electrón, pero son muy pocos, ¿ok? La mayoría de la conducción se debe a la ionización de los sitios de donantes, ¿ok? Entonces, por eso es que podemos decir que N es casi lo mismo que ND. En la región D, cuando estamos arriba de 450, eh, ahora sí, el proceso de creación de huecos electrones, así los que brincan el midcap, acuérdense que este es el midcap, ahora sí ya son muchos cuando estamos en caliente, por eso es que N es NI. So, what's physically happening is that when T approaches zero, there are no electrons jumping from here to here or from the donor sites from here to here. That's not happening. So that's why it's there are the n is about zero. Okay? But but that's region A. Oh sorry. That's region A. But in region B as we start to increase T a few but just a few electron whole pairs are created but just a few but donor sites start to give the fifth electron all a lot but not all of them that's why we have ed plus that's n when we reach about 150 we have Theoretically, ionize all of the donor sites, so we are fully ionized. And we still get some electron hole pairs, so we are crossing the mid cap, okay? But that ND is, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, that NA, pardon me, is. Uh, that's not true. Uh, that number of electron hole pairs being created by crossing midcap is way too small. So we are left with n being just ed. However, as we increase, so that's region C. When we go to section D, 
when t is m larger than 450 or more or less that quantity we're talking about silicon remember silicon now we start to create a lot of electron hole pairs so we're crossing this mid gap and because of that the number of electrons being created by crossing the mid gap by creating these electron hole pairs is so large that it exceeds nd and n equals ni n equals the intrinsic uh, number of carriers okay so that's what's physically happening And let me see. And finally, M that's it. Wait, give me a second because yep. Now let's see from figure two twenty. Uh, what will be a, a critical value for nd equals 10 to the 15. Let's look for that. Okay. If nd equals 10 to the 15, what will be the critical value? So let's go to to 20 for the three material for the three materials 10 to the 15 so first let me erase all of these annotations well that was correct this is ni so if we have oops sorry if we have that the concentration is 10 to the 15 that number has a critical value here right so it's in between 9 and 8 let's see this bar represent which number okay it's 400 agree with me it's here so it was between this line and these two. So it will be for germanium, it will be 385 Kelvin. That's a critical value for germanium. Okay. Now let's look for silicon, 10 to the 15. Okay, silicon. It's here so this is 500 yeah 500 uh, 500 and 10 and 20 and 30 and 45 let's say 545 silicon 540, 545. I will say that. 145. I will say. And finally, for silica for gallium arsenide. Well, let's find gallium arsenide first. Gallium arsenide is the third curve. What is it? Oh, that's gallium arsenide. Okay. And we want 10 to the 15, which is not here. <laughs> so for gallium arsenide, it is larger than 700 Kelvin. We don't have a graph that includes that number. So what's the result? Which are the critical values 
for a, though that concentration of a, donors. Well, for silicon is 545 Kelvin. I have it here. It's actually 545. Well, that's what we got from for the graph. For germanium is 385 Kelvin. And for gallium martianite is 700. Okay. Um, if you see a, as we go from germanium, then to silicon, and then to gallium arsenide, we have a larger temperature, which means that the larger the temperature, the wider the cap is, okay? For instance, another compound, silicon with carbon, silicon carbide, I think it's called, has a gap of two electron volts, which is huge. Um, so, well, that's, for instance, an, applic an, ap an application of this temperature dependence of uh, the current concentration. And, well, I think we're, I think we're done, probably, almost done. We, we've seen um, density of states, the Fermi function, the current concentration intrinsic, and how that is equal to, in an intrinsic material, the number of electrons and holes, how the product of electrons and holes is an I square, the equation for charge neutrality, the equations for N and P in dope materials when those are uh, non -de non degenerate. What is an extrinsic material, and what is a majority carrier? Well, that either n on p, n or p, which is a larger, right? And the minority carrier, well, the opposite. Uh, let's go back a bit. Uh, in this case. We are talking about electrons, right? So that will be the majority carrier. Uh, holes, we are assuming that there, there are quite, uh, there are uh, much less of them. There are not many of those. So that will be the minority carrier. And uh, I think that will be all of it. Pardon me, pardon me. And yep, I think that would be all. Yep, thank you.